11. Coach Al, Rachel says, flipping open her steno notebook. Can I start with the interview with some background questions? This is for the school paper, Rachel. He's taking down the volleyball net. Except for the two of them, the gym is empty. Their voices echo. Yes, I'm doing a feature on some of the special teachers. I don't think I'm special, Coach Al says, but he looks pleased. He's shorter, stocky, with powerful-looking arms. He's wearing green pants, a green and white striped shirt. Are you married, Coach Al? Divorced. Do you have children? My daughter, Kimberly. She lives with her mother. He falls silent, and Rachel wonders if she's making him sad. She remembers seeing him one day last summer at the salad bar in the supermarket, filling a clear plastic container with chunks of tomatoes and carrots and mounds of potato salad. Her eyes sting unexpectedly with the recollection. Did you always want to be a coach? She says. When I was growing up, all I wanted to do was be a basketball player, Rachel. What happened? Was there a moment when things changed when you knew you wanted to make coaching your life's work? She wonders if she sounds okay. This has been a strange day. Actually, she's been strange, here and not here, in and out of herself. She doesn't know anything or how to describe it. One moment, she's in residence, telling herself she really has to work harder to learn geometry theorems. The next moment, she's floating, up there on the ceiling. Rachel observing, Rachel observing, Rachel Well, Rachel, Coach Al is saying, I realized when I was about 17 that I had stopped growing and I could never be a proper basketball player because I was too short. It wasn't a matter of height. I just... heart. It wasn't a matter of heart. I had plenty of that. I was just too short to make it. She thinks about giving up her own dreams of being a writer. Why would it happen? Maybe if she lost her fingers... But then she could take her stories into a tape and but then she could tell her stories to a tape recorder. What if she lost her fingers and voice both? She read a book once about a man who was totally paralyzed. The only ways he could make himself understood were grunts and gasps, but his toes had movement, so he learned to paint and type with his feet. Coach Al is looking at her. She's not supposed to be daydreaming. She's supposed to be asking intelligent questions. She clears her throat. Uh, how, how did you feel giving up your dream? Was it awful? Coach Al wraps the net around the post. I was disappointed, but then I thought, well, it's not the end of the world. I went out for all the sports in college. Basketball, baseball, wrestling. My coach told me, concentrate your abilities, Albert. Always concentrate your abilities, the abilities, your abilities. Stick to one thing. You'll steadily improve, and it's going to hold, and it's going to give you confidence. Good advice. I went to wrestling. I became a great wrestler. I have quite a few trophies at home. Was there anything special you did? Besides training hard, I'm always making sure to wear something green. Don't ask me why. Just a little thing of mine. They started calling me the Green Flash. <laughs> they put that in the college newspaper. Yeah. Okay. Which means I'll probably sit down and finish working. Okay. Um, we'll probably be back around 8.30. Okay. If that's too long and you need me, call me. Okay. All right. Have fun. Mm. Mm. And then we'll figure out a day when you feel like going to the airport. Okay. The green flash. They put that in the college newspaper. The green flash wins again. (laughs) Green. G-R-N-F-L-S-H. Rachel writes. And she gets a green flash of her own. Coach Al is enjoying this interview. Maybe nobody ever asks him about himself. Everyone asks him questions all the time. But it's always, Coach Al, can I get an excuse from Jim? 
Coach Al, will you help me with my jump shot? Coach Al, will you show me that grip again? Let me mention this friend of mine. Coach Al is saying, Lefty, Lefty Lefkowitz, prime guy, great athlete, but he never neglected the books. Hit the books, Albert, he told me. You'll never be, you'll never be sorry. Now that's more good advice. Are you putting that down? Rachel nods. She has been taking notes steadily, but when she looks down at the pad, what she sees are four scrawled words she didn't even know she had written. My grandfather is dying. Coach Al? She breaks into the middle of a sentence. My grandfather is dying. Her heart bumps in her chest and she looks down at the polished floor. She didn't know she was going to cry today. And she doesn't know why she said it. Kojal blinks. His eyes are baby blue. I'm sorry, Rachel. He pats her arm. Outside it's raining and she finds Helena waiting for her near the front door. Helena takes Rachel's arm. That was a long interview. How's Coach Al? Helena, Rachel says. My grandfather is sick. He's dying. Oh, right. No. Helena puts her arm around Rachel, but all Rachel is thinking is that she's done it again. First Coach Al, now Helena. Isn't she just using Grandpa Izzy's illness to make herself important? Behind her ribs, there seems to be an empty space. Has it no feelings? She had tears for Coach Al's loneliness, but where are her tears for her grandfather? My grandfather is dying. Does she plan to tell everybody that the man behind the, man behind the counter when she buys a pack of gum? My grandfather is dying. Strangers on the street? My grandfather is dying. Maybe if she keeps saying it, she will feel it. She will believe it. In the movies, dying people clutch their chests. They fall splat on the floor with a great gush of blood. Or ketchup. Or they raise their heads for a last few brave words. What has that got to do with Izzy? Foolish. Foolish. I'll be here after you're gone, Shirley. Rachel. Maybe you'll let me go back to my game now. Are those the words of a dying man?